Um, hi, everyone. This, it's um, my great pleasure to actually introduce Mark Leaf. Um, it was, has been a, a great pleasure working with him over the summer. And he's going to be t um, talking about his evaluation of software tools for the annotation of uh, sequence variants. Thank you, Christina. Um, so my name is Mark. Um, and my presentation is titled Evaluation of Software Tools for the Annotation of Sequence Variants for Clinical Sequencing. So let's get into this rather meaty title and start breaking down some terms. Uh, first of all, what is clinical sequencing? Uh, clinical sequencing is when NITES such a, or labs such as uh, the NITE Diagnostic um, Lab um, takes uh, samples from a cancer patient's uh, tumor and uh, sequences it. Uh, they take that sequence line it up against uh, a reference genome, the human reference genome, and then use a variety of algorithms called variant calling algorithms to identify places in the sequences where there is variation. And these result in what we call variants. <clears throat> so the data set that I worked with for the summer consisted of 18 of these variants. And just to give you sort of a better idea of what exactly these mean, if you take the first row, um, you can think of the variant uh, like a genome address. So for the first uh, row, on chromosome 1, at that monstrously large number position, there is a C in the human reference, and in the sample taken from the tumor, there is a T. This is what we call a variant. Um, and what do we want to know about this variant? That's exactly what variant annotation is. Um, as you can infer from the name, uh, it involves attaching uh, relevant and useful bits of information to regions of the genome. So you can make conclusions about variants that fall within those regions. These uh, annotations can include things like, uh, like a basic annotation that was on the last slide, such as which gene does the variant fall into? Um, is this variant within a coding region? Things of that nature. There are also functional annotations. Um, what biochemical function does this region serve? Um, and the end goal of, of variant annotation is um, using this information to tie um, specific variants to various aspects of a disease, the disease progression, the root causes of these diseases. Um, and if you've heard the term personalized medicine, well, this is essentially personalized medicine. Um, using patient-specific variation to um, infer unique methods of treatment um, and basically gain insight into not just the disease in general, but the disease um, spe specified to that patient. So my job for the summer was reviewing software tools that perform these sort of annotations. Um, there are a number of these tools out there, um, and they all do um, different things. Um, the first two tools, Polyphen and SIF, um, are variant effect predictors. And what these tools do is um, take in um, a number of variants and will basically algorithmically provide a prediction about whether this variant will have a harmful or um, no effect on the protein that encompasses it. Uh, another uh, different category of tool is uh, KUVAR. This tool uh, stands for co-occurring variant analyzer. Um, when variants are looked at, they're usually looked at individually, which is not uh, a very realistic context. Um, what KUVAR does is look at all these variants simultaneously, um, which is a much more realistic take on what's going on. Uh, Regulome DB is a database which consists of uh, regulatory information. Uh, a lot of variants are provided mainly for um, coding regions, things within genes, within um, proteins, things of that nature. Regulome DB is sort of gives you a broader scope of annotations. And the rest of these tools um, that I've sort of named whole genome annotation suites are sort of a mishmash of these features. Um, they sort of combine functional effect predictors with uh, information aggregates and sort of um, assemble a number of different annotations as well as providing some sort of um, interpretation of these annotations. So um, when I was reviewing a tool, there were a number of considerations that I focused on. Um, the first was the usage model. Um, is there a website for this tool? Um, is this a command line tool? Do I have to download anything? Things of that nature. Uh, ease of use was another big one. Um, do I have to have a working understanding of the Perl programming language to configure this tool? Do I have to download hundreds of gigabytes of databases onto my computer? Um, do I need um, a lot of training in uh, genetics and biology to interpret the results? These are all very important considerations. Uh, data security was another big one. Um, since we're working with patient data and uh, it's very uh, sensitive, we'd rather not um, have it 
uh, lying on a strange server somewhere just because we queried a tool. Speed was another important factor. My data set was only 18 variants, but um, variant calls can produce millions of variants potentially, so being productive, uh, productively annotating these variants in a timely fashion was another very important consideration. Uh, annotations provided um, was also very important, obviously. Which databases uh, is the tool using to aggregate information? Um, what sort of annotations exactly are provided? And finally, a uniqueness factor. And the uniqueness factor was something that I really focused on because a lot of these tools um, have overlapping function. They pull from the same databases. They use the same scores. And so a unique factor characteristic about that tool was something that really made it stand out as there was a lot of overlap in functionality. Uh, so my method was pretty straightforward. I would read the journal article uh, written by the creators of the tool. I would uh, read the tool documentation so I could better understand how to use the tool, uh, how to uh, interpret the input and the output, things like that. I would then use the tool to annotate uh, my data set of 18 variants. I would collect notes about these annotations and I would compile the findings as a PowerPoint presentation. So one of the first tools I reviewed, SIFT, um, which stands for Sorts Intolerant from Tolerant. And what that refers to is intolerant variants from tolerant variants. Intolerant variants meaning this variant adversely affects the function of the protein that encompasses it. And tolerant meaning a change does occur, but the protein still functions normally. Um, this is a software tool that gives you um, a prediction in that regard. And SIFT primarily makes its uh, decisions based on um, evolutionary conservation. So a good way to think about that is giraffes have very long necks to reach food at the top of the trees, and giraffes with shorter necks died out. Evolutionary has deemed the long neck, neck trait to be important. Similarly, there are regions of sequence um, that persevere across generations and sometimes across species in a similar family um, that we can similarly say evolution has deemed um, important, so we refer to it as conserved. So for example, um, here are a number of species of bacteria on the left-hand side, and um, th these are their, their sequences. Um, and you can see regions where there's greater similarity and regions where there's uh, far less similarity. And how SIFT functions is, say this variant S over here is uh, entered into SIFT, and this region is much, is, is very low, has a low conservation rate. Um, so SIFT will determine this variant would be accepted um, because this portion of the sequence is uh, much more, um, open to change, it fluctuates a lot more. Evolution has not deemed it very important. For instance, if we look at the variant down there, that red column filled with L's, if we were to make a change in that portion of the sequence, SIFT would probably say, this is going to have a damaging effect. This is a conserved uh, region. Evolution has deemed this sequence to be important. Um, thus, this is going to be problematic um, if, when this variant occurs. Um, so the next brand of tools I reviewed, genome annotation suites, as I mentioned earlier. Um, sort of, I classified the information they provided into these four um, sort of umbrella terms. The first is the context. Uh, physically, where does it fall into the genome? Uh, is it within a gene? Is it within an exon? How many genes does it overlap? Transcript information, things like that. The predicted effect. A lot of these tools had pre-computed SIFT scores and polyphen, which is another um, functional predictor as well as um, making, as well as other methods of predicting the effect of a variant based on the annotations that it aggregated. Uh, and finally, or population diversity is another consideration. Does this variant occur across populations? How, ver how often does it occur? Things like that. Uh, known disease associations. Has this variant been attributed to, or been known to um, be associated with diseases in the past? And so all these annotations are provided. So one of the fav my favorite tools and the one I'm going to focus on now is called uh, Vario Watch. And um, this is just, uh, this is a view from Vario Watch that provides some insight into the context. And so why would we want to know about the context? Well, from this we can see those two little green triangles in the middle are two of the variants from my data set. Um, we can see that it falls within a coding region. Um, and Knowing the context is very important. Um, is it in a regulatory region? Will this either uh, cause gene expression to increase or decrease? Uh, is this, this is within a coding region. Is this going to cause a protein to malfunction or continue to behave normally or possibly behave weirdly? Um, we know that what gene this falls into. Uh, so based, the context is a very good, um, relatively basic annotation that we can determine about our variant. 
Uh, population diversity is probably the next one. Um, I like to think of the, the reason uh, population diversity is important is for investigating um, a rare uh, illness of some kind, something that occurs very infrequently. And we have a variant, say at the top, um, C and G. So in the reference, it is a C, and in the sample taken from the patient, uh, it's a G. And so what this tells us is that we're trying to tie these variants to a rare disease, but our variant occurs across populations uh, 28, in 28% of people, uh, in 66% of people. So it's unlikely that a variant that occurs in 66% of the population is going to be related to this rare illness that we're investigating. So VarioWatch provides a number of um, nice, aesthetically pleasing uh, graphics options to view your variants. You can get a nice chromosome-wide view up at the top. Um, and you can actually go to the specific gene, to the specific transcript, all the way down to the variant. And what VarioWatch does is classifies a variant um, with a risk level. It's low risk, it's medium risk, it's very high risk. And uh, one of the things that I really liked about VarioWatch is its transparency. Um, this, uh, at the very bottom here, is a risk level decision tree, which I'll get into more later. Um, this is my data set in VarioWatch, um, sort of a chromosome-wide view of where everything falls as well as it's color-coded by the risk level. So if we wanted to investigate more about why VarioWatch made um, a decision, for instance, on chromosome 17, it classified one of my variants as very high risk. Um, we could click on it, and it would actually give you, um, this is what I mentioned earlier, a risk-level decision tree, which sort of shows you the algorithm's thought process in uh, making its decision to classify the variant this way. Is it in a coding region? Yes, it is. So. Is it a non-synonymous change? Non-synonymous means that um, the nucleotide change um, affects the amino acid, so the protein sequence actually changes. A synonymous change changes the nucleotide, A, C, T, or G, um, but does not affect the protein sequence of amino acids. And finally, is this a nonsense mutation? Nonsense mutations are when um, a premature stop codon is formed, um, which means that the protein is basically, its manufacturing is, is halted early. Um, so it can be malformed and def will probably malfunction. So we can see um, VarioWatch, there's a lot of transparency in this tool. Some of the tools would just spit back, oh, this variant is high risk, and then you really have no way of determining where that decision came from. And VarioWatch had um, really good transparency in that regard. Um, so at the end of the summer, I was asked to um, sort of aggregate um, information from the various tools and make a um, conclusion about each variant as to whether um, in further investigation was needed. Um, and so basically, here's one example. The one I just showed you, the nonsense mutation, this is that variant. You can see that both SIFT and Polyfen identified it as uh, damaging due to stop. Um, VarioWatch classified it as very high risk. And SNP Nexus, another one of the tools I reviewed, reported that this variant had been previ previously associated with a number of cancers. So the consensus here was pretty easy to determine that this variant um, was probably worth continued research and investigation based on the conclusions of a number of tools sort of agreeing that this was a potentially harmful variant. Um, but it wasn't always that easy. There were, there were times when um, the tools would disagree with each other, um, which is where VarioWatch's transparency was very useful. Um, so here we see SIFT and Polyfen both reported this to be a synonymous mutation meaning once again that the nucleotide changed, but the protein sequence remained intact, um, and so no adverse effects were predicted. Um, but Regulome DB, which was, as I mentioned earlier, a tool that um, aggregated regulatory information outside of the coding scope, um, reported that there were some elements there. Um, and similarly, VarioWatch reported that this was a high-risk variant. So going into VarioWatch's um, decision tree, we can actually see that it agreed with regulatory DB and that there were some regulatory elements being affected. Um, so all in all, uh, I mentioned earlier, but VarioWatch I found to be the best all-around tool in terms of usability and annotations provided. It was a nice medium. Um, SNP Nexus provided the greatest number of useful annotations, um, but wasn't the most user-friendly. Um, and SIFT Polyfen I determined to be really excellent first steps for giving you an idea of functional significance of a variant. Finally, I'd just like to thank Christina for being a wonderful mentor and teacher, and the DMICE for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. yeah. So when you identify these variants, um, um, 
who who's the the user um, that you want to convey this to, and and what do they do with it? Is it, it researchers who are studying these things, or clinicians who may alter their therapy based on genomic findings, or both? Uh, right now, um, these tools are used in research, but have not reached um, the clinical level of use yet. Um, this comes from the fact that a lot of these annotations provided, and a lot of um, these predictions are exactly that, they're predictions. So they're more, um, it's more giving the researcher a bunch of clues with which they can use to make their own conclusion, rather than definitive evidence for a variant, this variant causes this, this disease in that nature. So right now, this is primarily for researchers. Great talk, by the way. Um, did any of these software packages handle variants other than um, like single nucleotide kind of variants? Yes. Um, the co-occurring variant analyzer that I mentioned briefly um, handled insertions and deletions. Um, but by and large, those were lacking from a lot of the tools. There were specifically changes. There wasn't a lot of, actually I don't think, I think Kuvar was the only tool I reviewed that um, annotated indels. So one thing that struck me is there's a proliferation of tools which indicates this uh, might be in an earlier stage of developing these tools, but there's a ton of knowledge you have to apply against this. I wonder if you can comment as you went through this if you found some tools that um, were um, that cost money or, or basically were trying to get, take, find resources or apply resources to, to build more complex, useful tools, or if these were all sort of free and available and developed through uh, from other researchers? Um, these were, all the ones I looked at were um, developed academically and were all free to use. Christina, maybe you can comment on if, uh, as far as the commercialization of these tools, if there's any corporate interest in developing things like this, I'm not so sure, maybe. Yeah. No, you're right, your assessment of this, right, it's really in the early stages, so there, there are very few commercially available ones and it's really in its infancy. How did you resolve conflicts? I mean, you had one case where the predictions seemed to disagree. Did you just take them, you know, the most serious looking prediction or did you, you know, I mean, databases have mistakes in them and so how do you know which is, uh, which is right, you know? Uh, well, the example I showed was more a dissonance between um, what the tool looked for than actual contradictory reports. So SIFT and Polyfen um, work within the coding scope, and the variants that they were disagreeing on were um, had to do with didn't have to do with protein sequence, but it had to do with regulation. So that I resolved it that way. I didn't have any clear instances where one one said this is a, like toss out this variant; it's extremely low risk, um, and other things were reporting this is extremely damaging. But the way I would counter that is by simply incorporating more tools. Um, the more annotations, the better, but when it comes down to it, they're, you know, if you have to make a decision whether to toss out a variant or pursue, the only thing that I can think of was just, would just be to aggregate more annotations about that variant. Yeah. Um, in, in any of these tools, did you notice if any of them did a good job with kind of keeping track of the um, provenance of kind of where the annotations are coming from? So. Um, well, actually, another, I didn't mention it, but another reason why Vario Watch was my favorite was because, I can go back, the tree that I showed you, at any point, at any, uh, for instance, if you were to click on the coding portion, it will actually provide a reference to the, it will, it will take you there to the database, to the tool that it used, um, and this was very useful, tantamount actually, um, because, I mean, these could all be, where is it getting this information, very important. So if you want to find out, um, there's a, there's a motif that was diminished. It would take you to the tool or to the database where essentially like a citation. So every step has a citation in this tool. Does that get saved into some kind of final output file that you can go back to later on? This is the online interface, but there are uh, downloadable um, .tsv files that do contain this information. Yeah. Um, did you code mostly in R, or did you have to use Perl? Um, I didn't really have to do much coding work. 
Um, I poked around in the code of a few of these tools. Um, a lot of them are written in Perl, um, which is very popular in, uh, language in bioinformatics applications. Um, a few were written in Java, um, and they advertised that fact a lot because it provided a considerable speed boost over other tools using one of those uh, main programming languages. But I didn't have to do a lot of coding this summer. Thank you very much. Is that good for everybody? All right. Is that, okay. Um, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Katie Abrahams. Uh, she has worked this summer as a summer intern on Karen, Ad Karen Eden's grant, and I have worked with her on the programming aspect of this grant. Katie is a computer science student at Portland State, and she's actually truly a computer scientist because <laughs> she's shown that she is really interested in computers. She is an excellent problem solver, and she picks up new technology probably about as fast as anyone I've ever met. So she's going to tell you about what she's done this summer to help with the mammography decision aid um, that Karen's group has been developing. Oh, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, so as Michelle said, this summer I worked with Dr. Eden, Dr. Rybar, and Lindsay Watson, who's going to present next to develop a decision aid called MammoPad to help women decide when to start getting mammograms. And uh, I know that coding uh, sort of takes on multiple meanings here at OHSU, which I discovered this summer. So yes, I'll, today I'll be talking about coding in the computer science sense. Um, and today I'll introduce what a decision aid is. I'll give a brief overview of current mammography research. And then I'll talk about our project and my role in development. So a decision aid is a tool to present and clarify an intervention or decision to be made. And ideally, they give evidence and options as well as potential outcomes to help guide a healthcare decision. They also help the user identify their personal values. Decision aids are supposed to facilitate communication and treatment. They are not designed to present one solution, make the choice for you, or to replace a healthcare professional. decision aid I worked on this summer is designed to help women of average risk in their 40s decide whether they want to start mammograms in their 40s or wait until their 50s. And our decision aid is built as a web application optimized for the iPad Mini. So the current research for mammography says that women of average risk for breast cancer should definitely begin to start getting mammograms in their 50s, though the jury's sort of out whether it's every one year or two years. But there's no expert consensus on starting in their 40s. Some say it's beneficial and can catch cancer early and save lives, while others say that it could lead to unnecessary expense or treatment for patients. So our app presents information in the form of text and graphics, so users can make an informed decision based on their values and current evidence. These two graphics, as well as the image on the previous slide, are an example of how we presented evidence to the users. These two graphics on this screen present statistics supported by an image, 
We wanted to show the information in multiple ways to reinforce it and to make it easy to understand. In this case, it contrasts the risk levels of average risk women for getting breast cancer in their 40s versus in their 50s, as these two graphics show that risk doubles over those 10 years. So my role in the project was to test and write portions of the application, which involved a lot of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I also hope to revise content. So uh, computer science is full of abbreviations, and a lot of which are opaque. Uh, as I mentioned, for Maripad, we used a lot of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, I wanted to give a quick overview. Uh, probably some of you may be familiar with these, but just in case, I don't want to talk about a lot of acronyms without anyone knowing what I'm talking about. So HTML is a language for creating websites. It's the skeleton and style of the website, and it provides underlying structure and formatting. CSS is a language for configuring and changing the look of a web page. It's what makes a website look nice, and it's used to kind of streamline the design process when you're making a web page. JavaScript is used to interact with the user or to create dynamic content. For our purposes, anything that needed to change after the page had been loaded in our app was done via JavaScript. For example, in an earlier version of our app, we had a sorting activity in which users sorted their priorities about mammograms and their health by clicking and dragging boxes um, on the page. And this was later changed to a selectable set of boxes. So uh, for a simple example, the top image is a piece of HTML source code that was the basis for an intro screen in our app. Using HTML with no styling, the rendered web page looks like the bottom image, which is not too interesting. Now, up at the top on this page is a piece of CSS source code, which was also applied to that same intro screen. CSS uses rules applied to portions of a website to dictate styling. As you can see, uh, the source code wasn't really designed with PowerPoint in mind, but I wanted to give uh, an idea of the stark difference between the source code and product. And the bottom image is uh, what the final intro screen looks like once all those HTML and CSS is applied. So using HTML and CSS, I modified the look of the app, adding features and making changes if the test users or our team found something lacking. Most of the modifications I made to the app related to usability. We wanted the app to be straightforward, easy to use, and informative, even for women with limited technical or healthcare experience. We used feedback from test users and usability to determine what we needed to add or change. I helped with layout, changes in color or text, and also help to implement some of the new features, like a report or a glossary, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, so the report, to start off, is generated at the end of the application, so users can access information from the app at a later date. We output the report in PDF form, with the idea that users can email it or print it for their own use, and the clinic can attach it to an electronic health record. And we also put a note saying you can bring this to your doctor, and then hopefully that would start a conversation about their treatment. So... On the next slide, this is an example of the first page of the report, a couple different versions. The first version that we mocked up was on the left, and then the current version that we're using right now is on the right. The report combines informational content with content specific to the user, such as their concerns or questions about mammograms, which uh, the dynamic content appears in italics, if that's clear. And there were some surprising revisions when we made the report. In testing, in the interviews that Lindsay's going to talk about, women brought up the fact they didn't have a doctor and so they're unsure what to do about questions related to talking to their physician. So we changed the wording to reflect that. that they might just be general questions. And I've circled those changes on the report to make it a little bit easier to see. The report uh, had some surprising challenges on the software side as well, since as it turns out, PDF generation isn't a built-in functionality for any of the languages we were using. But thankfully, people who develop useful software love to share it. And we we're able to add in report generation using an external software library. Um, the Mark's speech reminded me uh, the importance of documentation. One of the, some of the tools we tried to use had very, very little documentation, so it made it very interesting um, to try and adapt those. And adapting already developed software to a proprietary tool can be tricky, so the report went through a number of revisions. So I mentioned the glossary earlier. I also helped with coding that. We implemented this to improve ease of understanding when people were using the app. If there are any terms they didn't understand, wanted them to be able to just really easily, without stopping using the app, kind of be able to find a definition that was on a plain language. So these words that, that were in the glossary appeared as blue hyperlinks, which would trigger a pop-up when clicked. And the top image is just a page with some various words, how they have glossary terms. And the bottom is uh, 
that demonstrates the glossary definition for biopsy. And you can just really easily close it and keep using the app. So I learned quite a lot this summer, uh, both about programming languages and software development. I learned how to code websites and how to make use of user feedback while still keeping in mind the project's goals. Making the best use of feedback from app users can be deceptively difficult to do, especially within the timeline constraints of a project. And there are many, many steps for improving software usability. In our case, we wanted to write an app according to the decision aid protocols while still making it accessible to the target audience. The first edition of the app, which was made actually before I came on board, was vetted many, many times undergoing revisions at each step. Some design elements worked and stayed with the app through the entire development cycle, but far more often they changed, often dramatically. Uh, I learned that it's very important to listen to your users. Uh, they have been staring at the software for six weeks and not suffering from tunnel vision that comes from trying to perfect every little aspect of the software. And, uh, Hard, hard, important to remember, but easy to forget, when you sink hours of work into something, some aspect of development, only to find it's not effective, it can be very discouraging. Um, but listening to feedback and keeping the goals of the project in mind, which in this case, and in many cases, is to help people, it ultimately yields a much better piece of software. And uh, also this summer, I was able to help Dr. Eden and Dr. Arbar with three other research projects, including uh, data entry for a grant submission for the PCOR K-12 grant, survey scanning, for a middle school project that was done earlier, and formatting a journal submission. I got to look into the exacting standards that govern academic research, and our projects are developed, revised, and processed. I'd never seen the development side of research. I'd really only seen what's already been published and available to the public. So this is a really interesting look into the world of academic research. I really want to thank the MAMPAD dev team for working with me this summer and my fellow interns for insight into their projects and DMIS and OHSU for hosting us. Any questions? Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm curious. What was your user population like? Oh, yeah. Um, well, ultimately, we want this app to be available to women in... Uh, probably a little bit lower income bracket. We're going to release it to the Orphan Clinics, and Lindsay's going to talk a lot more about that. But um, the standards that we wanted to uh, keep to for the app were uh, plain language, which was eighth grade education. We're, not, we're expecting a little bit of variation with the education levels of people that are going to be using it, but definitely um, rural clinics and that sort of thing. And this may ultimately get released to the public, but right now that's our, our focus population. So <clears throat> I think many of us can relate to your experience of um, staring at the software for six weeks or six years and, <laughs> and uh, being discouraged by um, people not understanding it. Um, one, one of the challenges, though, that it seems you face, and you addressed this a little, but maybe you could comment on it further, is that there's so many different types of users, um, everyone from um, a... Um, you know, a professional, highly educated woman who, you know, knows a lot about, um, um, you know, mammography and those sorts of things to uh, those who are relatively uneducated. Did, did you, what experiences or what challenges may, did you find um, trying to um, create a tool for such a wide audience? Oh, definitely. Um, <laughs> that, that's a very good question. And I think that we sort of we definitely wanted to keep it very user friendly, so we erred on the side of providing more information. Where if women were very educated with mammograms, they may get information they already saw, but we really didn't want anyone to be in the dark. Um, and for this, I think, uh, and maybe maybe Lindsay knows a little bit more about this. She's working on the project a little longer, um, but I think that for our purposes, we we're focusing right now on this population that maybe don't know as much. Um, they're maybe coming to they don't. No, and actually there's a second report that we mocked up um, that, that Lindsay made and that we implemented where it just sort of says, this is generally information about mammograms and sort of not so much about the breast cancer side of it, but just the availability. Um, and I actually learned a lot this summer about mammograms. I, I knew very little um, about them before. And I think that, so right, right now in this stage of testing, we're definitely going to err on the side of caution sort of provide a lot of information, you know, things like the glossary and making it very user-friendly. But I think it's very difficult to expect all the different kinds of users that you might have. And that's, I've, there were so many unexpected and interesting questions in the interviews. 
to sort of, oh, we didn't think of that, or of course, maybe people don't know that. You know, working at OHSU, I think, surrounded by healthcare culture, um, it's difficult to, to remember what, uh, what's basic knowledge and what maybe isn't. <laughs> yes? No. Yeah, there was a lot, um, and I think both in when just our team testing it, sort of seeing it, and what was really, I think, the most memorable probably was uh, the graphics, which I know Lindsay will touch on in her presentation, because those are graphics and pictographs, and so I think they really stood out and people said, oh, this makes sense, or oh, this doesn't, and I know that kind of fine-tuning those took a long time. Um, but. Also, as far as people in the glossary, people just stopping and saying, well, what does that mean? I think I know what that means, but I'm not sure. And sort of adding in this plain language glossary, just sort of making it really easy for people to sort of, because I think the decision aid works best when people are able to really focus on what they think about mammograms, because it's a lot to do with you know, defining their values and everything. And so if they're stopping and starting and second guessing themselves, it's sort of difficult, I think, for them to remember why they're using the app. And I, I think, I'm not mistaken in saying that we really wanted people to feel very comfortable using it. Um, when you're uh, in a doctor's office and maybe really nervous about your mammogram or nervous about breast cancer, and I think, and at least for me, I really saw that we all wanted women to really feel comfortable and making this application user friendly. And even, well, that was the other thing with the iPad, the varying levels of, of knowledge people had about this new technology, I think was, was surprising because I, I, my second job is I work in a computer store, I work in a Mac store. And so I've been surrounded by this stuff for years. and stepping back and remembering that, oh, which button does this, and there's no buttons, and there's no keyboard, and how do I use this? It's, of course, people don't know. And, and that was really so interesting and surprising to me to kind of step back and, and look at this technology and how we use software from a perspective of people that, that don't do it every day and aren't computer science students. So it was very interesting, if that answers your question. Great. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Lindsay Watson. She has also been working on Karen Eden's um, project with Mammography Decision Aid. And Lindsay is a recent graduate of Washington State, and this is her second summer internship. And she's much more than an intern. She's actually a research assistant go-to person on the grant. And she just knows everything. We all go to her. <laughs> so she's going to talk more about um, the project, especially with the cognitive interview piece of the project. Thank you. So as introduced, I'm Lindsay Watson. Uh, my mentors are Dr. Uh, Rybar and Dr. Eden. Um, this is, as she said, my second summer internship here at DMICE. And last year, I did some qualitative analysis work with Dr. Eden um, with the original decision aid. And this year, or this summer, I'm working on um, uh, the development of the new version for the iPad Mini. So since Katie gave kind of a nice explanation of the, the background of the decision aid, I'll just focus on my main project, which was the cognitive interviewing portion of the app development. Um, I'll also provide a couple of examples of changes that resulted from the feedback um, and talk a little bit about what I learned during this project and what the next steps are for the, for the app. 
Um, so over the last few months, my main project was to recruit um, 15 age and risk appropriate women and interview them while they use the app. And at various stages of the development, I interviewed three to four women individually, and I spent about an hour with each individual woman, um, and having them go through the tool, answer questions about um, how usable it was, um, and um, their experience and just their general feedback in using the tool. And as app development had progressed, I worked on writing a plain language copy for the app and also making revisions in the content management system. So for the interviews themselves, they were semi-structured. We used a predetermined set of questions and then we also asked probing questions um, to co uh, clarify any comments that they made. Um, Uh, because uh, one of the priorities in creating this app was to ensure that the tool is accessible to a wider audience, um, one of our main goals of the interviews was to make sure that the information that we pre presented was um, clear and understandable. Um, and because breast cancer is such a sensitive subject, we also wanted to make sure that we weren't causing any undue um, anxiety or worry um, in the messages and the information that we were presenting. And... Um, we also looked for uh, feedback about the usability of the tool and tracked how long it took for the women to use the tool. And as you can imagine, this process is very iterative. So with each round of interviews, we would go back and implement the changes um, and redesign and reevaluate re with a new group of users. So just to give you an example, um, in the very first round of testing, we presented these four graphics depicting the same information about false positives and false negatives. Um, and to control for the learning effect, we showed them each in a different order to each of the four women um, and asked them to think aloud and describe what they learned from the image. Um, and we got a lot of feedback from, from all of the four women um, about each graphic. Um, from color choices to their emotional responses to the images. And when we compared the comments side by side, it was clear to us which image we would use um, in the future stages. Um, so would anyone like to guess which image we ended up using? Bottom right? Yeah, you're right. So this was the first draft of many versions of what we're now using in the decision aid. Um, at first glance, it looks like it's fairly clear. It presents the information, it gives the breakdown, and it looks like something that most people would be able to, to glean what we're, what we're trying to convey. Um, but of course, we had lots of comments and feedback from the users, and um, we... Uh, one of the one of the comments that was made is um, that the two pink shades were too close, and that they should have there should be more contrast between the two. Um, one woman commented that the boxes weren't balanced; um, they were they seemed off kilter. The two bottom boxes there, um, and someone also suggested that we use um, or that we provide the positive information first. Um, meaning putting the larger number of women that don't have cancer above the number of women who do have cancer. And so this is the most current version that we're using now. Uh, most of the changes came from the um, user feedback. Um, we added more specific information about the risk and age of the women being screened. We, um, we did end up moving the positive information to the top. We changed the colors so that um, there's more contrast between normal and abnormal. Um, let's see. And we also balanced out the boxes so you can see that there's. And this one. Um, 
for this graphic, we were intending to convey um, in a clever way that we don't know which woman out of the 70 will get cancer um, or will get breast cancer. Um, however, we had two women in the interviews who expressed that the graphic made them feel uncomfortable and one woman actually said that she felt like it was a ticking time bomb um, ready to go or preparing to go off counting down. Um, and what's interesting to me is that while we were trying to convey uncertainty, they were having this anxiety um, and that was, that was definitely not the message that was being received. So to, um, the solution was to slowly fade to a question mark, which um, still conveys the same message, but is much more gentle and uh, <laughs> not so anxiety provoking. Um, and these are just two examples of the many changes and um, processes that we went through, um, just uh, fine-tuning the tool for uh, an audience with, um, with limited literacy. Which brings me to what I learned um, over this uh, summer internship. Um, this is my first experience with app development, so um, I definitely learned a lot. I specifically um, learned that it, the app design process is very iterative and um, definitely full of surprises. And it was also fascinating to see how each team member contributed their own expertise to the development of the tool. I worked with a variety of different um, scientists, uh, doctors, computer programmers, um, graphic designers who also have their MD. Um, <laughs> it was, um, that was one of the most interesting parts was seeing how everybody um, added their own contributions. Um, and last but not least, I discovered um, just how difficult it is to translate complex health information to, um, into plain language. Um, for example, um, I have here, um, if you try to define or explain genetic, a genetic mutation to somebody who has limited experience with genetics or might not even know what genes are. Um, personally, I, um, when defining terms or trying to explain something um, to, to someone with, say, an eighth grade education level, I imagine talking to my 12-year-old nephews or um, um, I have some experience teaching kindergartners, so using that sort of mindset of breaking things down into very simple terms um, is not as easy as it seems. Um, and we also had a, um, a numeracy expert and an eighth grade English teacher who came in and helped us with the, with the plain language. Um, and a couple of other tricks, actually. We had a, a style manual for low health literacy, and we also used um, Wikipedia, which has a language translator into plain language um, as one of their um, uh, languages on most of the, most of the pages. Um, overall, the feedback from the participants and experts was invaluable in developing an evidence-based decision aid that was accessible to women with limited literacy skills. And we are now in the final stages. We're just fine-tuning the app. Um, we have one more round of cognitive interviews before we pretest um, 10, um, 10 women. And then we will hopefully be going live in clinics in uh, late September. And after testing, we are um, eventually we would like to get the MammaPad as Katie mentioned, um, out to the public for use in clinics. So thank you to everybody that I worked with and DMICE for this opportunity. And questions? Go ahead. Oh. I have a question on your the color choices. How do you, you know, colors have all kinds of, you know, implicit the meanings to different people. And mm -hmm. I noticed, you know, when you changed from the two versions of pink to pink and blue, the, the blue was the positive results, you know, the negative test results, the good results, and the pink was the bad ones, you know. And was that feedback from the users, or how was that this decision 
made? Because it right. seems, to me, it seemed a little backwards, but I'm not the, the target audience, so I kind of wonder how it was informed. <laughs> Um, well, I think that we, we stuck with pink and blue because things like red and green are fairly loaded. And we wanted to stay away from that positive and the negative. Because if you, if you look at the graphic, there, we're not trying to say that uh, of all of those normal results, there is still that abnormal, or that one woman with cancer. And with the abnormal results, 98 don't have cancer. So it's not necessarily a good versus bad that we were trying to to get across, I guess would be. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. Maybe David or Michelle could could help on why we chose blue. I don't remember the specific reason. There was no real specific rhyme or reason initially. I mean, we started with the red-green scheme, you know, Fairly common interpretation: red being bad, green being good. Uh, but in further iterations, we thought, as Mich uh, you know, and Michelle and Lindsay mentioned to us, that you know these are fairly loaded. We don't want to be suggesting things to people. And I think it tested poorly initially too. Someone commented about the red and green being mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. So um, this started with like a pink and pink. But again, as someone mentioned, they wanted higher contrast between the colors. So it was just a high contrast color choice between the two. And then in further testing from there. I don't believe there was any comments about the colors after that point. So, you know, it worked, so we stuck with it. But, you know, there was no specific blue means this, pink means this that we were trying to convey. Okay. Yeah, so uh, a lot of people in this room know that I'm always interested in trying to find the connections between the clinical and the bio side of our program. And I'm actually thinking, I'm thinking of your comment about people having a hard time understanding what a genetic mutation is and, and Mark's talk, because in, in the future, clinicians will um, be um, presented with, you know, multiple different gene mutations that are going to influence how we treat people. Mm -hmm. You have any thoughts on, on how you will convey that sort of information to, to patients, especially, um, you know, lesser educated patients in a decision aid? Um, I think that's definitely something that is worth looking into. I mean, I, I have personal experience going into a, like a genetic counseling um, where even that is is way above an eighth grade literacy level. So, and I think that um, most health literature is above an eighth grade literacy level. So it is definitely something that should be should be done is to kind of break it down so that it's more accessible to to wider audiences. That answers your question? Well, I, I, I think it's a challenge for, for us all going mm -hmm. forward. Oh. Um, are the sizes of the circles proportional, and does the size influence decision behavior? Um, that second question is a really good question. Um, the your first question, we, we did change the size of the abnormal results to be more proportionate because that was one of the comments was that it, it seemed disproportionate. It is disproportionate, definitely, in this. Um, so we did make that change. I don't think that it's exact, but yeah. I mean, it's not exact. I was thinking about doing like this fancy mathematics and calculated the volume circumference and all that. But it would have just been like the screen space we had if we made it that small would be hard to present that information. So it's not at all proportionate. Well, I, I think it's interesting because, you know, scientifically you might want to present them as proportional. But if you're trying to convince users to act in a certain way or to act in a value based way, then it might make sense to make the abnormal results bigger because the impact of that result is bigger for the users. Okay. Well, th I think what we tried to stay away from is trying to guide them towards the decision. We're more trying to present the information in as neutral a way as possible. Could you tell us more, <clears throat> excuse me, more about your cognitive interviews? Did you interview the same subjects more than once? Um, no, we, no, we, we had different groups for each. We do have some women on our minds to bring back 
after we've made all of the changes. Um, but yeah, it's been uh, different groups each time. All right. Thank you. Thank you.